Right, today I'm going to move into a territory that um, is grossly unfashionable, which is a discussion of the plan. Uh, there are even rumors going around that, that many people get quite a long way now without ever drawing a plan. Uh, there's a further rumor, which is that they get quite a long way without actually knowing what a plan does. And somebody said to me, sort of in, 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 in jest yesterday, be careful, they may not be able to read plans. I can't believe that this is true. But <clears throat> in terms of architectural composition, the real question is that presume, you know, presuming that the majority of people who actually build buildings follow uh, the position of objects on the ground or whatever replaces the ground, uh, therefore some kind of plan comes into play at some point. The question is to what extent it comes in at the conceptual stage or to what extent the business of organizing things um, is part of the conceptual issue uh, or whether you do stuff and then hope that it fits in. I must admit that I have often seen work where you do the stuff, the thing, and then you hope to hell it will fit in. And then, of course, if you're very clever, there are tricks of the trade of making it look as if it fits in because nobody ever gets around the back to see that it doesn't fit in. You can also argue that, you know, um, if you take, for example, the changes that are made to large airports, such as Heathrow or Frankfurt, um, for example, that you can reorganize. As long as you tell people where they are to go with arrows and other devices, you can take them up and down and sideways and round, and they never probably touch the body of the building, or at least conceptually don't touch the body of the building. In other words, a, a world can exist within a kind of curious vacuum by which the skin, the outer edge of the building, is nothing to do with the part that you use or ever see. Um, intellectually, that is amusing and intriguing. I'm not sure, though, whether it's always the best way to go about things. I left you, I seem to remember, two weeks ago, talk, showing you the Bauhaus building and saying that the various elemental parts of it each had their own expression. And in fact, I realized I got, a, I think, a better picture of it this time, which actually shows that very graphically, that there's a particular kind of fenestration, particular kind of windows for one kind of activity and different windows for another. And that was then, and that was nice and easy, seems easy anyhow in retrospect, and saves a lot of bother. But of course, it, it has been replaced sometimes by figuration which is much more cool, maybe, but much more puzzling. You, I guess you know what I'm going to say. The L-shaped part is probably doing exactly the same thing as the slab part. But for various reasons of couture, the slab part has horizontal lines, and the L-shaped part has vertical and minor horizontal lines. Why not? It's people that's sitting at computers behind there, probably. And the structure is probably a steel frame or concrete frame structure, almost certainly. And you could say, well, does it matter? It's like a piece of couture. The object of many pieces of couture is to conceal parts of the body which are less than perfect, or to accentuate parts of the body which might be more perfect. Now, way back when, in the days of sort of junky tone architecture, this is to say, I have a horrible suspicion that the two come from the same city, but I might be wrong. But at least um, there, it was the opposite. It, it is conceivable that the part with the vertical red stripes and the part with the yellow patch of wall and the part with the target on them, and the part with the 
curtain walling on, have also <laughs> got people sitting behind at computers and that the frame is probably steel frame or concrete frame. It, it is just conceivable if you look closely that the red vertical stripe part is where the elevators are uh, and therefore uh, would be solid. But isn't it funny that then the person comes and paints it so that it looks as if it, it might not be solid. So there's a sort of double take and a double take immediately there. And this is a sort of period where you want to make it look interesting, quote unquote, and everything's happening all over the place. Uh, the two buildings could not be more different in, in the way that they attack the eye. Although this question as to what they're saying is still up in the air. And then I found this one in Korea the other day, which is particularly a uh, tiresome looking object. Uh, God knows what the, the, the ring is telling. It's not actually a McDonald's advertisement, so it must be telling us something else. And then there's a, a very curious piece of mannerism running down the side where there is this line here. On close inspection, I'm not sure. If it is a lift lobby, which I don't think it is, then why would it be bigger further up than below? No, it is not a lift lobby, so maybe those are apartments because they have different curtains behind. Then if that is so, what is that? And then what is that anyhow? And is there something very unpleasant happening here because it's rather narrow? Something more pleasant happening here because it's wider? Uh, I can't help myself as a designer asking these questions because, um, you know, I've just left a situation this morning where we are manipulating pieces of geometry in order to put things in them. Oh, where is that? Where have I heard that before? And, 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 you know, there are certain moments at which I say to somebody, yes, but that's getting too narrow, you won't be able to fit it in. There's a certain plodding, and here's a young lady from that same establishment who's not been involved in that particular project, but, uh, and therefore can, uh, can wear a bow in her hair. But um, it is a curious business, isn't it? And, and here's somebody else, the adjoining building, less less tiresome perhaps but still quirky well, one wonders what one's what's re why maybe that was a, a building bylaw requirement maybe that is to simply say we can't get the lift up there but we can get a, an expensive apartment i mean you have to what what i'm really saying is that you look at these things and you have to do a lot of sort of detective work and it's still probably wrong in the days of the bauhaus there was a certain morality in in, in saying that is where people are in offices, that is where people are in workshops, that is where the caretaker lives. Or, of course, you get intriguing buildings which are mostly concerned with what goes on inside, but they are sufficiently big for there to be a lot going on inside. I don't pretend that this is a particularly special diagram. There's a sort of U or L-shaped solid part of the building and a big, big, atrium and there is the atrium and then the building sort of folds around it. There is a little piece of historical interest about this because Lebius Woods worked for several years on this building. I don't say that he designed the building. It was actually done by Roche Dinkelu who are quite capable of setting out the design parameters. But it's intriguing to think of Lebius Woods' drawings and then to think that before he did the most famous of those drawings he was sitting working on this building. Maybe he did that bit. Yeah, you never know. Again, detective work has to go in, but, but my reason for using it is that it's a, it is a, a actually much loved building. People, New Yorkers say that of its period, um, it was a, a reasonable building, but it looks pretty ploddy in the drawings uh, because it is either solid or atrium. And that was the sort of period condition. If we go, of course, to a heroic example, if we go to the Barcelona Pavilion, Miss van der Rohe, the plan form is an indulgence. It is, it is a, if you like, a toy. It is a piece of theatrical manipulation, careful and, 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 and uh, clever heroic work and there's always lots of conversations about what really happens here 
in this hidden space where the glazing doesn't let you see right the way through. And there's all, all sorts of discussions about the, the finesse of positioning. It's not really positioning for, for normal um, functional purposes. It is, after all, an exhibition pavilion. Although I did, curiously, a year ago, go to a supper that was held in there. And they brought out tables such as they would bring out uh, in, in, in any sort of uh, event place. Tables with white linen tablecloths and sort of chicken legs and glasses of wine and waiters. It was very weird because there one was sitting in this extremely talked about heroic building. And once you put enough of the tables and the waiters and stuff, it just looks like a hotel now. It looks like any old sort of hotel dining room. None the worse for that. But suddenly the specialness is taken away. I digress sort of intentionally because, in a sense, what is concerned here is that the precise positioning of these very special walls and filters and, and passages works if that is all there is in the building. As soon as you put tables in, it's, you only see the ceiling. Uh, and the same architect at the same period in his life made another building, in fact, more untidy because, after all, people are having to live in there and they do have tables, and they do have chairs, even if they're, and, and they do have a rather oddly sized grand piano, I have to say, but um, a sort of mini grand, I suspect. But they did, you know, it was built for a very rich family and they did have artifacts. Though it's interesting to see that Mies van der Rohe himself uses curves several times, well, two or three times in, in, in the organization, and the detailing is impeccable, but I digress. What I'm intrigued about is whether, to what extent, his, his um, how, what word can I use, his, his, his sort of uh, determination to maintain a certain kind of architecture is brackets reasonably or unreasonably interfered with by the necessity to have handrails to perhaps put the detail of the edge of the, of the stair in such a way that it would weather better uh, to deal with window sills and edges, different edges for different conditions. And I don't think that's uh, a result of the, of the reconstruction. You know, it, was, it, it was a Communist Party headquarters, I think, for Brno for some years, and then it was given back uh, and uh, it was repaired. But what is interesting to me is that, in fact, the, the plan is a mixture of, of the kind of abstracted, almost de steel kind of arrangement and life as it is lived. There are parts where you can very, very reasonably say, yes, if you're having a small dinner party or just the family, it's quite nice to be in a contained space and you hear everybody's voice. Those of us who use London or New York restaurants know that the problem now at dinner is to be able to hear anybody. And there he's anticipating it. And there's ample space for Mies chairs and this funny piano and so on. But on the other hand, it is to some extent pulled into the kind of doctrinaire need of an almost a steel plan. So it's a sort of, it's a, it's a halfway point. And elsewhere, uh, the same architect was prepared to be tougher, perhaps with a very different client, perhaps given an American situation, uh, he felt he could be more extreme. It, was more, it had become more, more or less, dare I say it, a mise splendeur commodity by that time. Whereas the Tugendhat house in Bruno is still for an identifiable family, that is the Tugendhats. And here is, is um, Philip Johnson following the master with an even less, in a sense, a less committed uh, building. This is simply the rectangle and one special condition. Uh, a lot of fuss made of the entrance for such a minimalist house, interestingly. But it's intriguing to see what happens where 
The needs of a family, or a rather extraordinary family, because they seem to have a lot, a lot, a lot of bedrooms, but anyhow, a family perhaps that entertained many visitors. And um, it's, it's for artists, in fact, the seven studios are therefore not, strictly speaking, a bedroom format, and not, they, they each have a loo or something at the end, and therefore can make an icon each of themselves. And then all you need is one eccentric part of the building at the end. That is, in a sense, a very easy brief, and can almost get to abstraction. I think if one had, let's say, 20 artist studios, um, it, it could get almost abstracted. So it's, on, it's again on a sort of borderline between the regular and the particular, the abstracted and the non-abstracted. Very lucky if you can get a brief that can do that. In the case of the Salk Institute, Louis Kahn, some years later, uh, organizes a very large research organization into a series of repeat elements that surround the core elements. And of course, have, there's a wonderful view of the ocean, which, is, which you can't describe on a plan, but is there. What is intriguing is, again, rather like the Lursa building, he takes the protruding element, and that, in a sense, creates the architecture. Uh, as a sort of aside, looking again at this photograph, and I haven't seen the building for a very long, I have seen it, but a very, very long time ago, I'm reminded of where Tadarando got it from, or got some of it from. This does seem very Ando-like. But so far, we're in safe territory, sort of. Because the organize or the, the, the choice of the parts of the organization which you articulate is such in these last two buildings that one doesn't need to fear for their abstraction or their relative abstraction they are. Yes, yeah, so it's the sort of ABA condition. I'm going to show sometimes some things that I may come back on in the next lecture. Uh, it's interesting to sometimes see the same architect with a different diagrammatization. And this one is really loaded because I could say that the, for my generation or the generations just slightly ahead of me, uh, the Richards Laboratories, also by Louis Kahn at Philadelphia, were a kind of germinating plan. They were the, 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 the very often stated notion that you had this, the servant and the served. This is the laboratory, and these were the servant elements. And the servant elements also were to do with the structure. And that was your formula, and that's what you did. And interestingly, that's what the Rogers office did uh, at Lloyd's. They were very influenced by the calm proposition. The servant elements, by this time, are much more elaborate. The served element is a single element. And sometimes the ser servant pieces are, are major, you know, including the entrance condition. But the proposition is the same proposition. You have your main activity, and then you block the things that serve it, thereby, by implication, keeping, keeping things free. Except here, where they put this rhetorical uh, and often quoted escalator system. Uh, and it's interesting to speculate that if you could have made the building work without that, which you probably could, you simply pile some more, uh, you know, you pile some escalators here or somewhere, whether it would have not, whether it wouldn't have had the same kind of heroism. So in a sense, it's a little bit of a sort of 19th century concept, that the great stairs and then the, 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 the arcade over it, which is a, which is a sort of anglicization of the Kahn proposition. And of course, Kahn himself can sometimes play it very, very cool. I mean, this isn't cool because these are all, as you know, marble, and they let in a wonderful kind of light, and the library is inside. 
and I haven't got the plan. I'm not, what I'm saying is the same architect can sometimes flip the proposition. This is a more current building. I guess you all know it. It's the um, Library for Seattle by Omar. What's interesting is we are, we are attracted by the very strong pop proposition of the skin of the building, the structure of the building. It's, it's full on. The plan is a rather ordinary plan. You cut out this corner, you fill the servant parts into this area, and that's it. In other words, the plan is concealing many of the same pieces of apparatus as, say, the Lloyds building, but they are not expressed. They are put inside the envelope, even though, from time to time, they themselves are quite heroic. And I love, I love winding ramps down into the corner of the site. I think that's, that's always a very... Uh, but what is interesting is that there is... If you take the geometry of it, there's almost a kind of square. But in reality, it's a little, it's a smaller square object with a piece sticking out that then absorbs this, so that the plan probably makes it look more interesting than the reality, because a, a ramp just going in is neither here nor there. And here, Frank Lloyd Wright has, again, a family to deal with. Uh, a specific family and organizes certain things so that there are heroic spaces and shoved in spaces to be perfectly frank but what is mattering to him is that the building as a whole has this horizontal power so that in fact although let's if you take say this floor the ground floor item A B C D E have to be strung along. What you read is a single condition. And that is something that we all have done from time to time. Not so Mr. Sharoon. Not so Mr. Sharoon. Isn't it funny that, that the photograph, the many photographs that appear uh, of this building, this house, um, always show this bit. And what's, if you're a sort of plan reading cynic, what's fascinating is nobody ever shows you that bit. You wonder why. Does it you, you peer at the photograph and see that it might maybe it gets a bit ordinary at the back there. It's almost like sort of saying, that's what I want you to look at. That's going on behind. Um, and of course this is wonderful stuff. I think this is this is still one of the most extraordinary architectural, this is one of my very favourite architectural visions. Uh, the biographers say, well, because it was all to do with the fact that Sharoon grew up in Bremen. Bremen is a port. He was looking at ships. Uh, maybe it's as simple as that. Well, he was looking at ships. He says, I'll do one of those down in the very opposite corner of Germany, where they a very long way away from any ships. But he has a lovely time putting this, he's got a probably correct size grand piano. Maybe it's a sub subplot of my, my own cynical interest in plans is to look to see how big the grand piano is and whether that tells you anything about, I mean now, well it, it, you don't use stencils, you, use, you presumably press a button and the grand piano appears. I'm of the generation had grand piano stencils. You never questioned whether they were a Beckstein or a Steinway or a sort of Yamaha. Uh, you just trace the stencil. I guess you do the same. I doubt whether there is a sort of you print in Yamaha number three, four, six, and a slightly longer grand piano comes out. I mean, I'm interested in things like that because if one's interested in how things work, maybe it's this morning having come from <laughs> dealing with something where very precise dimensions are involved. Um, I'm fascinated that that um, again, rather like Mies van der Rohe. He puts a table of the fat, well, a rather bigger family here, in the middle of the major space. The key thing was sitting round at table and conversing and discussing with maybe one or two guests, and then repairing to the grand long room with the corner with the piano in it. I can't help feeling that this came first, and that, in a way, 
could have been any, any length, any width. It would more or less function the same. But we never see what went on there. And having once been the recipient of, of, a, of a booking into a, into a very complicated triangular bedroom in Chicago where I could just about get the suitcase round and get my body round. And then the bed was marvellous and, and enormous, but it was all to fit into a, a building that was that shape. Um, it was weird. Whereas a friend of mine, in fact a former student when I was teaching here, Catherine Findlay, made a very extraordinary house. And again, I'm reserving showing you the picture of this until next week, two weeks' time. Because what I think is interesting is how, in this case, the plan is very much the product of the object. Uh, and then, it's interesting seeing it in section, how actually the bath can be fitted in and the door just, and the stair just. And then Catherine gets up to the top of the stair and enjoys herself putting a funny thing in there. I think because being quite a straightforward Scottish lady, deep down, uh, it was sort of, it was there and it's inviting you to do something useful with it. And a, a, a Scottish lady finding herself in Japan for 20 years or more is a very interesting, very interesting background, I think. Uh, so that we're back into the wonderful and loopy and exuberant. But there she feels the need to do something sensible. This is my guess. I haven't questioned her on the issue. Uh, and there, when, it, when push comes to shove again, there's the need to do something sensible on the roof there. Um, I can also report that when she was a student of ours here many, many years ago, she did this stuff. She's almost the only person I know who did, when she started building, did the stuff that she was doing when she was at the AA, which is wonderful. Harder for her now that she's returned to the UK. This is Mr. Sharoon again. He's got an ordinary piece of, of God knows what they are, they're bedrooms or something. And there's some more of them there. Yes, it's a hostel, they must be bedrooms. And then a, a flash gap. There's a, there's a term that we used to use for when you had two bits of operation and you, they maybe were different or in different positions and you needed to join them. The bit that joined we called the flash gap. It's, it, it would apply if it was two pieces of wood coming that close or two school blocks of many metres long coming together. Then the, there's a kind of mastic, a kind of conceptual mastic that holds them together. Usually the trick is to make the conceptual mastic, i.e. the flash gap block, look different. You make it lower or you make it higher or something. You say, I've got to join that to that, but it's going to be very difficult. I'll put something else there and I'll make the something else look different. Therefore the two arms or the two legs can be different. Here is a funny one because again it's a little bit like the other Sharoon building. The photograph the published photograph, the, the sexy photograph, is this piece. If we look at the plan, it's actually a very subordinate piece. In fact, it's not, it doesn't seem to be doing anything very much at all. It's great. I, I'm not knocking it. It's a lovely, lovely thing. But the actual business of the building is that bit. And for some reason, rather more favoured people who have not only a bigger room, but a wobbly, a wobbled room. That's interesting. I don't know what the brief is for the build, building other than it says it's a hostel, but I, I start reading into that. I start saying, these people are immensely privileged. They're close to the sexy part of the building. Maybe they have a better view, I'm guessing. They certainly have more space. And these are the regular guys down the back. And, and they're all right. It's a nice building, but the, 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 you can see whether the, the money psychological money or real money has been put into the project. So what I'm doing in a sense, I'm reading, I'm reading plans not just from a sort of functional point of view, I'm reading them from a sort of state mental point of view as well. Sort of where do you put your effort? Where do you put your fancy pieces? Where do you, how do you string them along? And this which is a very much admired building herrings, um, building which the cows have this arrangement for themselves, which is a bit unusual. This means that not every 
cow is bum to bum. Some of them are sort of round the side, which might amuse them somewhat. And and the the little little rooms. I don't know quite what that room is, but it's probably for the sort of cow manager or something. And and, and these are all useful. I mean, that is a lovely shape for a useful room. I don't know whether milk churns stack better in a shape like that, but they probably don't stack any worse, so what the hell. And, and the, there is a celebration of simply cows uh, being dealt with. But what he has done is to do also one other thing, and this is where it gets intriguing. And I'm sure he, if he were alive, would be able to explain, or maybe somebody like Peter Blundell Jones would explain, why that bit of wall stops being brick and starts being something else. And once you've started that game, you say, all, you know, interesting shape, got the cows in there, it's all fine. Now, it's a brick building, except when it's not a brick building. And that, for those of us who are interested in these things, is it intriguing. Why did the brick stop there? Why didn't it just go up in brick? You can do that, you can do that shape in brick, you can do that shape in brick, same. Similar here and here, here. Or did he get bored? Or has it actually got brick behind it? That sort of thing it moves off from just a discussion of the plan, though it may have some relation to it. It may, it may. Doing a kind of elemental building, but in a rather cute way, I suppose one could say, is what this is about. It takes a series of conditions, and actually almost as wildly as that, as that coloured Japanese building, it separates them into several architectures. One, two, three, four, at least maybe five architectures, and then stacks the architectures in a rather intriguing way, not necessarily regularly. It makes one architecture hold the other, uh, but it doesn't do quite the same thing here. Then if you held this, you say, ah, the rule of the, of, of the tube holding the slab is repeated, but the slab is very different. And if we've got a tube holding a slab, Oh, what the hell, we might as well put another slab on the top there and people can go out and look at the, at the scenery. It, it becomes almost a sort of ta tableware operation. I'm not saying much about the plan, which is all right, but not that interesting. But what happens if you have the same kind of condition, but you only do it once and you're much more phlegmatic uh, and you're some years before and you're in America? which is much more phlegmatic anyhow. And you stick all the serv service elements down the side. Instead of having fun with them like Kahn or Rogers, you simply say, no, we've got an envelope, stick them down the side, it'll work, all these people can get out of lifts and stuff. And then you just say, hey, hold it. We'll celebrate the corner with that slightly irritating thing at the top. Uh, we'll celebrate the corner. But what's funny about it, it's not, you know, if we go back one, this guy's really celebrating, celebrating all over the place. The corner is the building, really. The corner makes it different from the rest. Here, the corner is almost an apology for a corner. I guess if you're on ground level, you notice this, and it was very decorated. But it's, it's in a sense, still a pragmatic building with one al allowing itself to amuse on the corner, but then from my Christmas would be not doing anything very nice with it once you've got it. You come in and suddenly it, 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 it's, it's, it's sort of mean. What's interesting about this building is, is that the, the, the complexity of expression is actually seen in the vertical figure, that is to say, the look of the building. The plan is much more tough and quite logical. I mean, the whole thing is sort of logical, but and, and actually the most interesting thing about the building, I think, is that it, it, that it sits on top of a public open space. This, is, this glass runs in, as you know, 
there's an enormous space under there which all sorts of people dust down and meet each other and it's a really it's really a contribution to the city that it allows for a bank it's extraordinary it allows itself to to uh, give the pop the populace so to speak the space but the action is going on in the technique and the plan it's quite a, a a tough but logical plan. I'm now going where I have them split. I'm tending to show the plan first, so that we can do a bit of a sort of guess. It's too easy if we show the picture and then say, "Ah, oh, well, then this is how he does it." Let's look at the plan without the picture first of all and see if there is a logic. Clearly, the emphasis is upon the stair and and the trick. It's almost what I call the gent's toilet trick, which is a gent's toilet. You come in and you can't see into the toilet because there's a wall, and then you go around. It's, it's one which we find ourselves using very often in entrance conditions without there having to be a gent's behind. In fact, of course, it's Venturi's mother who was behind, and, and Venturi's mother's stare. Let them into the porch pull them around rather complicatedly, and then you climb up. And then everything really is subsumed to this core condition. The walls have this, this bedroom has this useful or useless corner so that you can feed that bit of circulation. This also has a funny corner, so you can use that circulation. True, you can get the loo out of it as well. Here's, here's a conditions I was hinting at that happens in airports, but much more. But who cares what's behind as long as you get through. It's all concentrated here, really. Otherwise, it's a one, two, three strip plan. And of course, it's concentrated, because that's where the architecture is. And, and light and so on play their part. Now, I'm going to play the dangerous game of showing one of my own buildings. And to try and analyse it in the same terms, what is going on in this building? If we cut the crap, there's a site where you have to keep one of the buildings, or two of the buildings, here. And you have to hold this building, you have to rebuild this building, and retain these two buildings. And what is left is a piece of shape. And as I've said many, many times, we squeezed out like a toothpaste into the shape. And these distances are to do with fire regulation. So you got as close as you could and just slurped it round. And then, in compositional terms, one drapes this additional piece so that although it's a shape, it's a shape which is, arrives there in the same, I dare I suggest, elemental tradition as the Bauhaus. The front building is the retained metal building and is the, houses the uh, Camera Austria organization. The back building is retained. The new building is a pair of galleries sitting on top of a restaurant. And that is the naughty piece. We talk a lot when we describe the building about the naughty nozzle, but this is really the naughty. This is the extra that is not exactly required except for compositional reasons. And there I think I fall into the delightful trap of Mr. Sherwood and others, which says, if you took that piece away, it would be a wobbly building sitting with a flash gap, notice the flash gap, to a straight building swinging around. But ah! Take the bar and you lock it. Somehow you lock it. And I think that instinctively one was work going straight, without saying so, one was going straight back to what I would call old style first year compositional exercise. Still lives, if you like. And we have an orange and a piece of cake and a tray and a cup. And somehow there is an agreeable place where the cup sits vis a vis the orange and a disagreeable condition. And then when we see the stuff, everybody gets more concerned by the fact that it's a, 
a, a bubbly thing and that it has these lights that come on at night and that this is very old and anyhow it was brought in from England and so on and so on and so on and then actually even the, the stuff that's shown on inside uh, interestingly there's some graffiti underneath the whole thing on the riverbank which which is very rarely seen certainly I took this photo so it's not a high quality photo but I didn't mind there being the graffiti underneath but I noticed every professional photographer has, has bled that out, never shows that, that real life goes on underneath anyway. But basically, this is that form of composition. Here is the flash gap condition, in fact. And what you do, you separate and have something different. Maybe one should have come up with something more original. In other ways, a very brilliant and clever thing is to pull the eccentric element if that's what it is, or the, the special element, into the bosom of the building, into the legs of the building. You pull this guy in. He's the focus of the whole operation. These are useful but subordinate parts. You pull it in. And it becomes two things. As you see it in, in Stockholm from a distance, that is the thing that you read first. Ah, that's where the library is. But Asplund pulls it in and then locks. You don't see it expressed on the ground at all. You discover it as, a, as if it were anew. You come into this extraordinary room without the decoy of this being interesting. This apparently is, is fairly bland, fairly straightforward. So that you come uninter uninterruptedly into that room. Well, sort of, because actually this, this, my own favourite bit of the building are these, these stairs here, which go into a mysterious part of the building. In fact, not shown in this drawing, they go up into the children's room, which is this wonderfully romantic space. So that what he does is a very clever thing. He takes, and, and, and classically, classically, this is the hardest part of the building to manipulate, to pull that circle into that rectangle. It's very difficult. Where do you stop? And Asplund was brilliant enough to say, that's where we have the special. In the crevice between the two parts, we run the very, very special, but for the connoisseur. Generally, people go up there and say, ooh, ah, to the big space in the circle. But for the specialist, this is, this is an added, added joy. You have to be very good to do that sort of thing. And I think what is intriguing about this building, which I'm sure you all know, this is a picture like me, is that we read predominantly that and we read the proposition that these elements are laid into it. What we don't know until we see the plan is that there was actually a lot of knitting going on. Because a lot of this, a lot of designing buildings is, is knitting. Once you've had the first few ideas. It's a question of knitting things in. And um, I'm not sure whether he himself did the knitting or he said, look, it's got to fit into there. You guys get on with it and for fuck's sake get three cars in. Uh, which is how things go. And then Charlie or Charles or whoever it might have been, somebody in the office said, if we turn them on the diagonal, we can get the three and if we put them on the side, uh, Mr. Kubuzi would be very angry because the car would be hitting something else. You know, it's, that's the sort of thing that happens. You, you, you have that as an instruction. It's got, to fit, it's got to leave a distance behind the basic box. So the, the trick is to turn the cars. Uh, and then you have a very interesting little kind of nookie there. Whereas here, it's tighter planning, tougher planning. Though if you were being extremely picky as a, a, a plan, you would say, do I not notice repeat circulation? Do we need two lots, two wings of circulation when one might do? But I'm being picky, because I spend a lot of time looking at plans. Whereas Mr. Gaudi was able to take a very straightforward proposition. It's what he does with it. I mean, that's often the thing. If you work that way around, um, 
I think a lot of you guys probably do, do what you do with it first and hope that the plan will fit. I have a suspicion that Gandhi was, was able to do it two ways to the middle and say, right, I've got two party walls running down the side, I've got my main circulation here, and we've got to have a... Or actually, the fancy one is that one. We've got to have two lots of circulation anyhow, for whatever reason. And then let's string some chambers in and along, and when there's room for them to be really fruity, we make them really fruity. When they don't need to be quite so fruity, they're just enclosures, although we'll round the corners just for willing. We'll, we'll, we'll keep the manners in the same. But the organisation is A, B, C, organisation, just like lots of other people have to do. And um, no, I can't remember whether this is Victor Orta, I think it's Victor Orta. What we're seeing here is the picture of the central space. And the organisation then is of a front part, uh, an interstitial part and the back part, but the cent the, the, you're, you're pulling in an emphasis. You're pulling, most people of the period would have made the emphasis on the street. As far as plans suggest, it's fairly cool by Porter standards on the street, but you pull this, you pull the whole system around, you have this gyratory thing, which is quite, it's quite an original and interesting way of going about dealing with a, a long, thin building, even if it wasn't as fruity as this, even if it was much more ordinarily styled, one would say, ah, oh, that's intriguing, you come in pull onto the stack and you wind, you almost psychologically wind yourself around. Whereas here, the Alto uh, Sanatorium is more direct. It's not quite as, 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 as uh, direct as the Bauhaus, so it's similar principles that the mannerism of this block is different from the mannerism of that block. And you have a wonderful flash gap here where not only are there two linear blocks that you pull pull away and the, 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 almost this is a piece of mastic that can <coughs> you, could, you could argue that this could stretch on a number of different geometries. It could go that way, that way, that way. And, and, and then you have to fine tune what is the appropriate angle because this will, this will accommodate anything. That's a nice old trick to, to, to use this gummy, gummy hinge as it were. Uh, whereas if you're more orthodox and you're more concerned with faces, the faces of the building, then the organisation is much more, or, much more ordinary. I don't think Dudok was of a mind to <coughs> accommodate gummy parts or fruity parts. Uh, you can do a, a one-shot situation. Um, so Melnikov takes this diagonal, and that is the gesture, and the rest is even quite straightforward. In fact, you know, I don't think that's, by today's standards, a very exciting facade. But this doesn't have to be, doesn't want to be, because this is what it's all about. This violation is what it's all about. And then when we get to extreme fruit, we get wonderful situations, which is to say, brick will do anything, or wine anywhere, and little old cottagey <coughs> Dutch tradition will wind anywhere. And then you do an extraordinary thing which you apparently set up an axis, which is what the building at first tells you it's about. But actually it's a wind-round building. The building has its own power and intricacy as it winds round. This is almost a decoy, as is that one, which if you look isn't quite the same axis. So it's full of little decoys. That is decoy, a decoy to suggest that there's an importance to that. But in fact, it's just an event as you go around. Well, this which is a very curious... If you lop off these two ends, it's a very orthodox office building with a courtyard, maybe. Uh, and then it allows its extremities to do what they will, almost. That, in particular is very, very um, virtuoso condition to actually, because this, is, this would, would be very common of the period, large gate, 
courtyard offices either side. But no, then to suddenly let it go, take the orthodox thing and then say, very few people have done that before or since. That one I've forgotten who did it, so I'll move past. Um, and therefore, we have to say that there are traditional or fairly established forms of organisation and planning which served for a very long time for very many buildings. This happens to be the Viceroy's house in New Delhi. Again, I'm deliberately not showing you the picture of it. What I'm simply showing you is that a kind of Ecole de Beaux-Arts plan served for a long time for many very large buildings. And if you look at the work of the Beaux-Arts students, or even if you look at things like the plan of, of uh, the Houses of Parliament in London, done by, plan by Barry, building by Pugin, uh, these sorts of orthodoxies lasted for a very long time. And I can even point out certain American firms of architects, commercial firms, who still do though they pretend otherwise, still do the same sort of planning. Um, not sure I put that one in. Ah, this is a building which, for my generation, was, was very particular. And again, it, it starts off by being orthodox. It is a drum inside a court with a series of galleries wrapped around it. Slight variation there but then full of strange, quirky things that sprout out from that proposition. Uh, and it was James Sterling, I think, having a sort of love-hate relationship with, with um, German neoclassicism, but doing things with it that, that none of his German friends could bring themselves to do or understand. Or you have wonderful correct building like this, which is almost neoclassical in its planning, and then has this the, the nub part of it shafted onto the end. What is intriguing to me is that the two parts of the building are roughly equal in size. It's as if you take building A and extraordinary building B that, that without the flash gap, the, the first building is its own flash gap. We might have a look at that next time and see what it did. Or this building, which, which went to, uh, to drop into an East Anglian industrial town, that is to say Ipswich. Uh, and I lived in Ipswich as a child. And when I went back to see the building many years later, I could not believe that this is, that happened to this very ordinary town that I lived in. It was very, as a former Ipswich person, I couldn't believe that the thing had landed. It was weird and it's black glass and it's a strange shape. But when push comes to shove, I think Foster's office is almost one of the first to do what I think a lot of you probably do, which is to have this wonderful shape, this wonderful, extraordinary object for the time that dropped down and said, God, we've got to get this, you know, this in and this in and this in and this in. And they sort of pretty competent. They managed to get it in. And of course, the trick probably was to make the footprint, certainly at ground level, the footprint of the building slightly larger than you needed. In fact, they made it so large that they had a swimming pool in there. They said, oh, well, well it's very nice for workers to have a swimming pool in the basement. And everyone said, oh, 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 oh yeah, yes, 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 why not? And you can actually see the swimming pool through the glass from the street. But I will return to that. And this is a funny one by a very interesting man. Um, a quirky, well again, it's hard, it's very hard work to pull this back to being the product of a series of rational moves because yes, there is a sort of corridor with rooms off it, but ooh, ooh, there's a lot of fun and games going on to get onto that corridor. And here's another, um, no, that's not a corridor with rooms off it. We are reminded a little bit of the Venturi plan and I think but Peter Corrigan, who is an Australian architect of great interest, very, very interesting man, who has also done quite a lot of theatre design, but has done a lot of houses. Um, and it's interesting that as a, a, an important teacher in Melbourne, I used 
to be able to spot a Melbourne student who'd passed through his hands because they always did very quirky plans of a particular kind. I think I'm out of practice now. I haven't met any for a long time, but a Peter Corrigan student, of whom there were many, was always, <laughs> always spot them because they always did these very strange, interesting. I mean, it's, 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 it's a real teaser, this one. And I ought to dislike it, but I'm intrigued by the man. This, is, this always gets very difficult when you know the person. This is also a plan done largely with a, uh, by, by uh, a person who used to teach at this school with great influence called Peter Wilson. And when he and his wife, Julia, got this building, which was their first big competition win, it was a, an immense breakthrough. And what's intriguing to people who were around at the time is to spot some of the conversations that were going on in the AA at the time uh, quoted in the building. I didn't see the building until many years after it was finished. And I can report that it is, I'm sure this kind of thing is very unfashionable. But it's a brilliant building. It's a, it's a building in which they put every piece of their talent and energy in, and it is extremely satisfying as a library. But I will hopefully return to it, because I sort of want to whet your appetite via the plans for once. Uh, a building which I know a little bit, not quite ever having pulled it off, but intriguing. One system, a ship shape, we're back to Peter Wilson again, an orthodox, almost neoclassic piece, and another which, when you go into it, is like a miniature version, a miniature quotation of Asplund, and the, and the architects themselves admit that it is a miniature quotation of Asplund. And then a sort of interstitial condition, where they're not quite sure what they're doing, because I think they've been looking at, at those Roma Interrotta projects, so that it's a sort of, it's sort of busy, it's very big, so it looks bu less busy than it appears to be on plan. It's almost a, a, a pair of architects who are quite clever, but not quite clever enough, and, and a little bit too well informed to play it cool, as I suspect this person was. Nearly at the end, therefore, I'm fascinated to come back to something which is absolutely has to be sensible. Um, a fort, and it could have been any, I could have borrowed any fort. A fort has to do certain things to keep the buggers out and then acts as a protection for your own people. And there is a clear logic. Fortresses and castles have an immensely clear logic. You put up the, the main proposition is the wall, the defense of the wall, and to be able to shoot from it. And then anything actually could go on inside. It's not a bad... You don't have to be in, involved in battles to, to use that strategy. And here's a building I don't know at all, but I'm intrigued again by its, in a way, simplicity. You establish the core, then you simply wrap around it. Why not? So finally, some things that I don't explain, I'm going to reverse now, as a sort of, guess what's going on inside? Some of you may know the building. It's in Mexico City. It's the uh, library building by Juan O'Gorman. And I showed an O'Gorman building last time, the, cacti, the cacti were running around the edge of the, of the uh, studio building. This is now him playing universities, and what we can't help ourselves look at is, is the wallpaper, as it were, of, of the facade. Or ourselves, round the corner, where I'm not showing you the plan, I'm simply suggesting that it is putting one thing on top of another, on top of another. And maybe that's a proposition, it's actually just a, a layering, each of which has its own plan condition. Or this, which is a Danish building, I think by, again, the same person that I showed one of the buildings last week. I showed her her translucent building last week. I'm now showing her metal sheathed building 
uh, where it would be interesting to speculate as to what the plan is doing and is it necessary for that connection to be made? Or is this mannerism, like if she simply put the centrifugal sort of element there and the outhouse there, you'd have two boxes. And she's too stylish for that. She says, no, we will And Zaha does the same sort of thing. And uh, I, this, again, would be interesting to guess what was going on in plan. We might get closer in this case. And then you get little buildings uh, like the Scimitar Tower in, uh, in Los Angeles, in Culver City, which is Eric Moss's latest building, where no, I mean, <laughs> in fact, they're very complex working drawings, but no plan is required because the plan is what you see. You get what you see. <laughs> you go past it and it is a stair on a plate with a lift and some screens. There's certain buildings where you can actually dispense with all that I've been talking about so far and simply say, you get what you get and it's a machine. Though it actually does require a certain amount of fixing of things in the right position. So somebody drew some plans. And here's another teaser, because this is an extraordinary, wonderful and famous building pulled down, I guess, in, in 1915, because it was the glass pavilion in Cologne of Bruno Town. What we normally see in history books is the outside of it, which predates Buckminster Fuller's domes. It's a sort of Bucky dome with a pointed top, but done 20 or more years before Bucky. What we don't ever see is the inside. What you probably would have experienced as a visitor where you were around Germany in 1914 would have been this. And it was, after all, a glass pavilion. It was all to do with showing the potentials of glass. And what you wouldn't have noticed, but now we can notice, is that actually it's a very orthodox kind of plan. It's a centralised plan with a lot of almost classical kind of organisation around it. Uh, but it was a wonderful, you know, we, we, we're caught then on one leg because the, the thing that interests us now is it's predating about Mr Fuller. What you would have engaged with would probably have been that, and in a funny way, that kind of organisation at the time would have been more familiar, coming in up a, up a grand stair, winding round a central space, which was a kind of dome, would have not been unknown at that time. But it, the way that it did it was the point. I think that um, Fujimori is a fascinating guy, and he almost does without plans. His proposition of the two parts of this building, even if one is coming in at a very odd angle to the other, is enough. Dare I say it, do we need to see the plan? Because the proposition is, is that, and that alone, and there's so many other strangenesses. And then I just show you a drawing of a building that we've just uh, designed and will build shortly. Uh, where I'm deliberately not showing you the plan, but I would be intrigued to know, although there's one person sitting in the audience, maybe two, who know what the plan is doing, I would be intrigued to know if you could guess the plan. And similarly with these things. Here we were able to guess the plan and we were able to talk about the direct relation of that plan to what we see. My suggestion is that in much of the rest of the stuff I've shown today, uh, all is not always what it seems, but what is more important to that is what was it that mattered to the designer? Because in the end, the majority of you, I guess, are designing things. And a lot is to do with what matters to you at the moment that you make the decision. It may not always be what matters to everybody else. 
it may not always be what everybody else talks about, it may not be what uh, you're supposed to be concerned about, but, but I think a lot of the purity of a project or the, or the strength, the power of a project comes through what matters to you at that moment. But I don't think that what is going on inside and how things happen in sequence is necessarily unimportant. And it, that may actually be what matters to you. I think there's, that, that currently very few people would go around this building saying, I, what really matters to me is where we position things, how it works, what space we go from and what space we go to. I suspect that many of you, although there's some grey heads sitting here, many of you don't think of that kind of thing. Uh, sorry about this, guys. I'm breaking the horrible rule that one should never have it going on. Um, and um, I'm intrigued by that. But I want to, to some extent, come at you by stealth. I don't want to preach that there should be another position. I just think that there are lots and lots of ways of killing a cat, as they say. Okay, thank you.